treat the animal. Quite interestingly, that uh, the audience of our engagement this uh, afternoon, we have friends from um, FUSS, FUN, SMU, SMU, NUS, um, and a few other institutions from other places, yeah, from ICS. Thank you. 
observing strictly the COVID uh, protocol, right? I see even some of you are quite close to each other. I know you, your friends, you know, don't worry, your friends will not run away, right? So just make sure that uh, it's not too near, right? Okay? It's, uh, I'm sure there's an indicator there, right?
And before uh, I start my lecture, and I shouldn't be because I'm only a moderator here, uh, let's stop my uh, uh, enticement to do those. Yeah? And uh, let's uh, invite our, the chairman of Malay Heritage Foundation, Dr. Roshari Sana, to give an opening speech before uh, we open the uh, discussion topic. Proceed if you want to sit down.
my schedule to <laughs> speak for our security officer on that. But anyway, uh, still, I'm glad we are here. And um, can I just check first? Uh, all of you uh, speak English. Do you speak Malay? Do you understand Malay? How many of you don't understand Malay? All understand Malay. And uh, I would like to spend a bit of time first with the Mount Sebang because I, you know, as I mentioned, on all my titles, the foreign press, senior minister, state foreign press, I think forgot to mention the Kampung Bulu Kumulu Kampung. I was here for 10 years as chairman of the Malay Heritage Foundation, and then uh, <laughs> I was in Australia. Uh, So I was saying, I was saying that about Sebang Sebang. So first of all, let me just share with you about my own life journey and why, in fact, I personally felt uh, pushed, driven to do this book. This is the second book. The first book, a co-editor with Dr. No Sharia, was to celebrate or commemorate our 50th anniversary of Singapore's independence, called Majula. Yeah. There is also. My July 50th anniversary from the perspective of Malay, of Malay perspective. But here we're looking at beyond bicentennial, meaning that more than 200 years since the becoming of records, we go on beyond uh, that to 700 years. But equally important, equally if not important, we are looking at beyond bicentennial in the sense that we're looking forward. What does history mean for us? How has history contributed to what we are today? Our multiracial, multi-religious, secular, urban Singapore, in the context of the region of Nusantara, with two of our like, largest neighbors being predominantly Malay, Malaysia and Indonesia, and a multicultural, multi-religious setting in South Asia, and in the greater context of China, which is a lot, much larger and now very much facing tensions in terms of relations with America and Europe also being dragged in. So what are the ramifications in the context of Singapore, in the context of South Asia, in the context of the global tensions? They're all very relevant to what I'm, we are talking about in terms of beyond by centennial. But now quickly back to my own life journey. Do you know that I was almost killed in racial life? When we talk about Singapore, we look at Marina Bay, we look at Marina Bay Sands, we look at Orchard Road, we look at the glim the, the the glory and the glamour of Singapore. Many of us, especially the young, may have forgotten the history we went through. And I was almost killed in 1964 riots. I was not like you all, you all a bit senior Karan. At that time I was in secondary three. Raffles Institution, Raffles Road, and uh, this was the second riot. The first riot was in July 1964 during the Prophet Muhammad celebration. Then the government acted very fast, got rid of all the gangsters that caused a lot of trouble, and they thought we are safe to reopen Singapore. And lo and behold, in September, when we were back in school, Friday, and what you know, it was Friday, we were back in school. Suddenly, racial riot broke out again. I won't go into the history of our analysis why it broke out a second time. There are many theories to it. Some say about Singapore's problem, some say about Malaysia's problem, because Singapore was part of Malaysia then. The racial, the racial political concentration, which actually brought a lot of the kind of situation, the tension in Singapore, and the lack of the racial riot. Some say it really was instigated uh, by the Malaysian politicians. So, but anyway, that Friday, I had left school early to go to Jukmai Yuan, Friday prayer. And, and I didn't know, me and my friends didn't know that riots had broken out in Gilang Sarai. And we actually narrowly flew out of Rabasarod and went to PUB. PUB was then at City Hall to 
pay my friends the water bill. Then when we were there, we saw people rushing out of the office. They said, what are you kids doing here? Riot said, no, 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 curfew will be called. Please go home. We were really shaken. Didn't know what to do. We all had to take bus home. We didn't have cars at that time. The Malays were like relatively lagging behind. So many of the Chinese, because they own cars, managed to rush home. But many of the Malays were caught on the street. And we walked from City Hall to Hill Street in front of Chinese Chamber of Commerce. We waited for transport. No transport, no buses, all full. Then the lorry came. The lorry came, open that lorry. And then we saw the driver calling us about 20 of us Malay kids, you know, Malay kids and adults from his office. Signal to us come and free ride. So I had a look and said, my God, Chinese driver. Then I had another look. I saw that the attendant was a Malay. So I said, 50 50, what is that? So we all went in on the lorry, 20 of us, and we drove to Kalan Gas Road, where you know Lavender Street MRT station now is. Suddenly the lorry went dead. But we don't know why. And we saw a lot of street, cottage industries then, a lot of Chinese, young Chinese. So when the 20 of us, the lorry went dead, the, the natural instinct is to rise and find alternative transport. But when we, the 20 of us, rose, from the lorry, can you imagine what went to the mind of the Chinese boys standing by the street? They thought we were there to attack them. And they disappeared into their cottage industries. And the next second, they all came out with iron bars, acid bars, all kinds of weapons. And pandemonium broke loose. And I saw in my own eyes, I was then, you know, 17 year old kid. I saw people being killed, being made on the street. Even mouth for them. They can't distinguish between Malays and Indians. So the, even the Indians suffered that. So, but unfortunately, they escaped and we got managed to run out of Kampo Suku where the law is riot, the riot men, the police riot squad was there and we were safe. And I was given transport back to Kiram Sri. And I reached Kiram Sri, the reverse happened. Malays were attacking Chinese, Thai straw pullers, fruit sellers. I saw the worst of both sides, racial rights. And that, from that day onwards, I told myself, I will do all I can to make sure that this does not repeat. We must do all we can to bring about a multiracial, multireligious, harmonious Singapore. Another story I'd like to share with you. This was 1964. 1973, I went to Libya. I was invited President Gaddafi. Some of you remember President Gaddafi. Gaddafi was a hero then of the Muslim world. The Western world, the communist world, world. They, he said against the Muslims. So we all Muslims must rally together, stand together and fight the non-Muslims. And Anwar Ibrahim was there also as a student leader. I was there too. And quite a number of my friends who became student leaders in Indonesia were there too. Then, but fortunately for my own personal education, the whole conference stood up against Gaddafi and we said, no, we don't want your exclusivity. We want inclusivity. We want all of us to work together. Muslims, non-Muslims must work together to face the challenges of this world. And that was the second driving force in me to say why we all must work together to make our nation a more harmonious, multiracial, multi-religious Singapore. That's the driving force behind the two books. So I think, so racial rights, Libya, commitment to inclusivity, multiracialism, multiracial harmony. That's what the book, the reason behind the book is. Now as for Ilmu, I don't know how to go far. I think for those of you who bought this book, I hope you all have uh, seen this book, at least if not bought it, because I know it's very easy to carry around. I have to bring a crazy now. <laughs> but uh, if you just go through this book, you don't have to go far. There are volumes and volumes of articles written, including by Dr. Dr. Nosharia and, uh, and uh, uh, Fatwan Peter and al Tarzu, and they all contribute to the whole volume just in country. But I just want to share with you, in fact, just the quotes. If you look through the first few pages of the book, just the quotes alone from Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong to Deputy Prime Minister Heng Sui Kiat to Minister Masagos, in fact, Dr. Yaakov, I think you all must remember, also, he also spoke in Parliament a 
about the history of rifles and processing guns late in the 80s. So they all contribute to the, the quote from us. What we are trying to achieve to the book. Whether it's about history, whether it's in fact the rifles founded uh, Singapore, or about uh, the different languages and religion, as the uh, CPM said, our people knew that we had to take our faith and our children's futures in our own hands. So we fought for the right to chase our dreams on our own terms and chart our own destiny. I think it's referring to the process we went through from independence from British, Malaysia then, and then independence in Singapore. And Masa, I was mentioned about, I could see strong sense of citizenry, citizenry in Malaysia and in Singapore, in the sacrifice made by Lieutenant Adnan Saidi. Lieutenant Adnan, you know, story stays with me because his sacrifice is the best example of the three C's. Character, competence, and citizenry. Proven in sacrifice to defend the country from the enemy. And the enemy is not just about the soldiers or the men. The total social psyche of the people, the mind share, the mindset. I think that's what I mean. And then uh, Mr. Goldchok Tom was saying that in fact in 200 years we have not found in Singapore, but in fact the world finds in Singapore. It's not only important that we found uh, the new Singapore, the new development of Singapore, but with the opening, reopening of Singapore by rifles, it brought Singapore to the rest of the world and what we are today at Global City. And uh, President Halima Yaakov also mentioned about the shared journey, the values that uh, we held well for by our forefathers that continue to relevant and important for current and future years. So these are some of the quotes we have reflected on this and I think they say a lot about the book. And that's what we want to achieve through the book. And if you look at the contents page, you will see that in fact it's about identity, consolidation of the identity, uh, identity formation, what we are, Malays, multiracial, uh, about uh, identity consolidation, about institutions, for example, Amla, Muit, they are very important features, not only for the labor security, but also for what Singapore represents in terms of multi Although we are secular state, but we are multi religious and multi racial in, in, in essence. So, and then we also talk about personality, from Latin Adnan to AI, Ahmad Ibrahim, the first Attorney General, and what he contributed in terms of our independence. To uh, Zahora Ahmad, a woman member of parliament that practically saved the PAP from a vote of no confidence. If she had not voted for PAP during the vote of no confidence, Singapore would have been a different story. A lady, Zahora Ahmad. Today we are celebrating Ministry of MSF celebrating women, right? In our Singapore context, the role of women. Those days, they only had, only had problems with women in parliament, how she was actually marginalized by the Malay MP, the male Malay MP, so she got upset. You know, all, and if you read in, in the book, you will find the story behind uh, those incidents. And then the wider community, not only the Malays, but the Malays, the non Malays. How do non Malays look at us today? And here you find some articles that they are sharing with us in terms of how non Malays look at they share some of the angst, some of the sensitivities, some of the perceptions which uh, they thought are very typical for Singapore. So that to me, in essence, uh, is what the book is all about. And uh, so it's not just for Malays, but for all Singaporeans, our Singaporeans. After all, we are all Singaporeans. And I'd like to end on this note. I find this session is very, very important because we are talking about the young, the future, our hope. And that's why when the was first suggested to me by Dr. Masharil and Asa, immediately I said, yes, please. Because it's not just about understanding history, but it's also understanding the young. How do the young see history? How do the young benefit? Do they see differently from us? Sometimes my children even ask tell me, please, Baba, forget about your old grandfather's stories. You know, we are different. We are no more along Malay, Chinese, Indian, we are Singaporean. 
Yes, we are Singaporeans, and that's why we want this book for better understanding what we all mean. Thank you. Thank you, Jezano. Uh, very pertinent point to highlight the fact that the book is part and parcel of our national narrative. Uh, historical in its uh, many essence, and the, the final theme is actually uh, the engagement, especially the young, moving ahead and building up the discourse. All right, uh, we move on to the second uh, speaker, uh, much known as Pawan, Mr. Wang Hussein Zohri, was a former MP from 1980 to 1991. Uh, of course, uh, he's uh, synonymous with uh, one community institution in Singapore, which is LBKS, yeah? which is the Prophet Muhammad Birthday Memorial uh, Scholarship Fund. Yeah? He was the president of that organization for 17 years. Good afternoon, Mr. Power. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> when I have mentioned just now, the SMP is the meaning of seniors and the best seniors of the seniors. So I am.
In this book, I just want to take one chapter, and that is uh, on education. That's the chapter that I wrote, History of the Malay Education. During my time, you know, I grew up in the 50s, in the 60s, and so forth. School was very basic. Hardly any, you know, any privilege that we have now. We just have a building, a wooden desk, Blackboard, still with a chalk and chalk kind of thing. No echo, nothing. That was our eyes in the 50s, and probably I don't know whether your time is still there. So many things. But now you can see the tremendous development of education, not only in the infrastructure, but the community has gone through a phase of tremendous uh, progress. So, you can say that the probably the, the, the turning point or the, or the important milestone is the establishment of Yayasan Mandaki. Because Yayasan Mandaki drove the political leaders and the community leaders of that time in the 80s to strive together in a symbiotic relationship with the government. If the Malays had done it alone, on its own, it would take probably a much longer, longer years of progress. So Yasan Mandaki is indeed uh, a watershed in terms of giving the Malay the catalyst, the boost, and the fillet to go for education. Now, I think it's about 30 years.
each of them will be given 10 minutes to do the presentation as we have a PowerPoint slide. Yeah? Different from our seniors, uh, not that they don't know how to do a PowerPoint slide, it's just that you know, they prefer to, you know, to share their experience with their seasoned politicians. It's a borough, right? right? <laughs> and uh, uh, <coughs> before that, yeah, we have a, a series of discussions, right? Uh, to take about, uh, to, to discuss about some of these chapters, if it's possible to cover the entire book, yeah? We are not doing a book review here, but uh, I think teasing out some of the important points from the book and what lies ahead, the kind of engagement that we want, the kind of future discursive circles and discursive community that we can build. Remember, uh, we, can, we are part and parcel of the, the national narrative. We need a stronger presence. And that presence can only be possible if we envision, we plan, that, that in future, uh, many of uh, our uh, friends from the community are able to articulate and able to write and be part and parcel of it. One very good example is just for instance, yeah? let's ask ourselves, do we have one local uh, Singapore writers that have written Singapore Marine right? History. Until today, we get that one. The last one that was uh, written by a senior Chegu, yeah, Haji Guru that was in 1960. Right? And that text we used in Malaysian schools or even in Singapore schools. Right? But other than that, until today, we get to have. Yeah? Not likely we have this book, of course, but as one single compendium of history, we get to one scholar to write. Yeah, of course, articles all over the place, some monographs and so on. But let's hope that you know, not just history, but also education, right, community development, uh, religious institution, and so on. Right. Without further ado, let's invite uh, Ms. Diana. Honestly, we 
before I read the chapter, I did not know uh, who she was. But thanks to the book, you know, I I, I, I know that day hey, that there was a female leader back then in nineteen sixties who was fighting for Singapore, right? Um, we also have chapters about um, uh, Mr. Ahmad Ibrahim's father, yeah. Um, we also have a chapter on Ibn Abdullah, Cik Yusuf Isha, Zubi Zaid, uh, Adnan, etc. Et so, uh, in a broad sweep, we have important people featured in the book. Now, um, however, when we, like I said, when we talk about historical consciousness, a critical historical consciousness, it's not enough to just know the facts, events, people, dates, facts, and figures. That is not enough for us to generate a kind of critical awareness and consci consciousness. What is important is, um, as you can see on the screen, this is taken from the first chapter of the book. Uh, one must observe the impact of colonialism on the way Malay problems are discussed today. Colonialism created negative stereotypes of Malay and never considered structural impediments, including the conditions in feudal society. While they do not claim that Malay as uh, that Malay as a constructed ethnic group, they had problems with Malay values and religion as impeding Malay culture and development. So, um, at the start, this uh, the chapter, the introduction chapter, is very strong to tell us that this is where we should be headed in looking and um, understanding our history, not just about ourselves, but in, in total about Singapore. Um, so, the critique uh, of and problematizing of colonialism. Um, is, is mentioned in the first uh, introduction, but unfortunately, as we go through the chapters, um, it's a bit diluted. So, um, it is more talking about facts and figures and, uh, like I said, per personalities and their contribution in history, which is not wrong, but uh, some, long, some um, along the way, we realise that the critique of colonialism and colonialism is not felt so strongly after that. Yeah? And why exactly do we need to problematize this? Why do we need to problematize uh, colonialism and colonialism? It's because um, when we don't question, when we don't scrutinize colonialism and feudalism, uh, we will have a blind reverence to history. We will take it as it is, we will take it as a fact, we will take it that it's given, right? So therefore it's important to, to look at it in, uh, in, in Way. If we have a historical baggage, let's overcome it by looking at it critically. So, um, why is colonialism problematic? Uh, the critique of um, colonialism brought with it many things. One of it, uh, colonial capitalism, colonial scholarship in buttressing myths and stereotypes about the people here, be it Malay, be it Indian, be it Chinese. So, therefore, more importantly, we need to look at how is it problematic? And um, work such as Said Hussein Arasaka's uh, Myth of Indian Natives uh, are important in showing us uh, the function of myths in colonized societies. And uh, this was mentioned, the myth of the Lady Natives was mentioned in, in some of the chapters, uh, but uh, we don't see a kind of alternative that is proposed. Uh, it's, the book is mentioned, but we, we don't see how do we then look ahead and forge a different perspectives on the Malays or understanding uh, the Malays, right? Um, we also don't see uh, a critique towards colonial capitalism, which is also deliberated by Shadi Mahlouf uh, in one of his books, Malay Ideas of Development, but we don't see that kind of critique as well uh, in the book. Yeah. Um, more importantly, these colonial ideas, we know Malays are lazy, Malays are not hardworking, Malays are relax, lepas, and all these things. Um, they were they were colonial ideas, yeah. And many of us here, um, we will not be surprised that our young people don't know that. Our young people don't know that these are actually myths and stereotypes, and it gets reproduc uh, reproduced again and again. Because why? We don't critically analyze these stereotypes. So when we don't, we keep reproducing the same thing again and again, and it's very very dangerous because we ourselves as Malays. Yeah, and uh, this pervasiveness of stereotype is therefore the responsibility of everyone, especially youth, especially people who are interlocutors or are of education, 
um, we are responsible to analyze and criticize this kind of stereotypes. Yeah. Uh, that is on colonialism. We also need to look at feudalism. Uh, many of us think that feudalism is not related to us because Singapore, there is no feudal structure, right? We don't have Raja, we don't have Sultan, so why is feudalism uh, relevant to me? But that is where um, I think we need to stop, pause, and we need to think about our past feudalism. Before colonialism, we know um, the book also mentioned about the history of Sultan Hussein, uh, the Mongol Abdul Rahman, and this very place that you are in is our um, last time it was Sultan Kampungna. So it's very important. Feudalism, although it's not relevant, or it's not um, still it's not practiced today in Singapore, but it is part of our history, and we should know what went wrong. And um, if we shift our focus before 1819, this does not mean that we romanticize we must romanticize our past or glorify our feudal past. We are not saying that hey, we want Raja, we want Sultan. We are not saying that. But what we want to do is to look at what were the problems of our feudal leaders last time, right? For example, um, leadership, in terms of leadership, uh, capabilities of leadership of our Malay rulers, uh, which actually led to the demise of this place or this royal house. Um, there were no pro proper leadership, arguably, by some uh, scholars, uh, by the elites of the Malays in the past. And we know that good leadership is very, very important for any society. So over here, let me um, clarify. I'm not saying that you know we want to have sultan and we should you know find a sultan today for Singapore. No, but what is important is to understand what went wrong last time. A lot of us we are not interested. Who is Sultan Hussein? Who is um, who is Samuel uh, Abdul We don't. We, we are not interested in that. But uh, it's actually important so we know what happened last time. What was the mistake? Right. Um, so when we want to critique colonialism and feudalism, one important source to look at critique is actually our literary um, works uh, by different writers in different periods of time. So for example, in the colonial period, we have Bronte, Munchi Abdullah, and then in the 20th century, we have people like uh, writers, thinkers like Sheikh, uh, Sheikh uh, Al Hadi. And post independent period, we have uh, Cikgu Surahman, Cikgu Muhammad Aziz Muhammad. You know, all these works are not and should not be relegated to just literary and fiction. But we need to we need to understand that these works, although it's fiction, it is actually a record or it's a um, it's a witness to social change and historical change. And therefore, we need to look at these works and see, hey, what are they actually talking about? And um, we don't see that kind of perspective for, uh, in this book as well. That part is a little bit missing. And um, I mean, although Munshi Abdullah and Bronte is mentioned in the book, we don't see it a kind of um, um, introspection into their ideas on what, how they look at colonialism. So that's very important. Uh, if we have chapters dedicated on material culture, like say food culture, food, like like I said, road names, there should be a few on liter uh, the literary perspective as well. And last um, but not least, uh, we also like I think uh, mentioned by uh, Jake Dino as well. Um, identity formation uh, is also something that is very strong in the book. Um, although identity, I feel that it's important. Um, I think that uh, it's not enough to just assert what a Malay is, who is a Malay, because uh, it. I feel that. Uh, it may not be something um, that that could uh, help us come out of what is a, what is a problem of our community. Um, it's mentioned in the first chapter, actually, right, that um, the Malays should not be concerned about issues such as what a Malay is and what is the role of Islam in the Malay identity. But unfortunately, uh, I mean, this was mentioned in the first chapter that we should not be occupied with. Um, uh, identity and uh, ethnicity and things like that. But we see uh, assertion of what is a Malay? Um, what makes a Malay? And I feel that uh, we as Malay uh, people in Singapore, I don't think every day, you know, Dr. Adam always remind me, do you think every day people wake up, look at the mirror, ask themselves if they are Malay? You know, I mean, it's in a layman's term, but it tells us that we don't 
membership of the family. We do kita kita tak akan melalui yang kita ingin lalui. Tapi kenapa why there a preoccupation on assessing ourselves that we are Malay or you know nowadays we see a shift among my friends among the young. I'm not Malay lah. I'm Japanese by Persian blood, a bit of Indian. I'm not Malay, right? So in that sense, we have an identity crisis. Why? Because I can see this is my observation. I feel that some of us are shy to admit that we are Malay. Because is it because of the stereotypes that is attached to being Malay? So therefore, it goes back to the main point that is we need to always, always, always question where are these stereotypes coming from and. Where, where, how can we start to change it? And it starts from us, it starts from you guys here, youth of our community, and it will, it will hopefully, you know, be, um, this kind of stereotype can be changed one day. I mean, it cannot be overnight, but one day, hopefully, if everyone is concerned and conscious about what is articulated, then maybe one day it will be changed. Yeah, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. So uh, roughly, yeah, I think uh, before I hand over to the next speaker, uh, the point that I think Diana mentioned that uh, it's not about what the book never addressed. The book never pretends to address everything, right? It's, I think what she wants to paint is uh, for the future, right? The direction is not just what's been articulated, but what is not articulated critically. I think that's the point that we need, yeah? And of course, uh, in any kind of uh, uh, reading of a discourse, we are just not looking at what it contains, but what it is not uttered. What is not uttered, it means either there's a possibility it is by being silenced, or two, there is a possibility that it is not grasped by the people right, or the uh, particular intellectuals or writers. Right? So, I mean, this is the art of discoursing. Art of discoursing demands us to be wary of where are some of the gaps and so on, this is the way to move, right? And uh, since uh, Liana has covered on history, let's uh, move to our second speaker, Ahmad Ubaid, yeah? And Ubaid will be uh, referring to areas uh, around uh, religion, tradition, religious institution. Ubaid, time is yours. Of the term Malay Muslim, right? Uh, it's used to describe our Malay community and 
background when it comes to the utilizing this stuff. Uh, so I'm not here to talk about identity, what it means to be Malay, what it means to be a Muslim, but um, what I want to um, highlight is that this is a substantial term, not a superficial term. Substantial in the sense that this term reflects the centrality of our Islamic tradition within the Malay community. Right? So when I, what I mean by centrality is that our religious tradition possess a strong uh, influence in several aspects of our community, which is uh, social, uh, social, cultural, and also economical aspects of our community. So because of the centrality of our Islamic traditions within our Malay community, this means that our tradition, our religious tradition, is a strong catalyst, can be a strong catalyst for change. And I think, for example, a good example uh, would be what Professor Fred Alatas wrote in his book uh, of how uh, Islam, uh, Islamic traditions can be a positive catalyst, uh, for example, uh, in the context for sustainable development. You know, he cited how the usage of, re uh, of religion uh, can be used in the fight for against climate change. Uh, for example, uh, specifically, he said how the usage of plastic bags can be viewed as macrame, frowned upon in uh, Islamic context. Therefore, how we understand and practice our Islamic traditions uh, dictates the type of change and impact it can have on our own community. And change and impact doesn't necessarily mean positive. Right? We, we can see how in other parts of the world, religion is used um, for negative purposes, you know, in the name of extremism and terrorism and so on. So, which is why I believe it's of paramount importance that we evaluate our Islamic traditions you know, in the past and us to see how, uh, in which direction it can lead to in the future. Right. So, the question is how do we evaluate our Islamic tradition in our Malay community context? Now, uh, I believe that to evaluate our Islamic tradition, you know, just like how uh, it's uh, in the Beyond Bicentennial book, we must first understand how our Islamic tradition came to be in its current shape and form, meaning what is, uh, what is its origin, what is the process that it uh, underwent for it to be in the current state that it is today. Right? So by this I am referring to, um, his, I'm referring to the historical context of our Islamic tradition, meaning notable uh, phenomena and events um, that have shaped uh, our, our Islam and our Islamic community, because no religion is trapped in a vacuum, right? so, which means um, our Islamic traditions are greatly influenced by both internal and external, and external events. So what I mean by uh, internal events, uh, as you can see in my point number three, we have um, the Najwa Hathok, right, which uh, influenced, uh, you know, which, uh, which caused racial riots, but it also caused, there is a positive impact, that there's a rise of Amla, and also uh, a good example of, of an external phenomenon and event would be the Dawa Revivalism movement which occurred in the 70s and 80s, which honestly I didn't know much until I read the Beyond Byzantine book. So, uh, so I think uh, the chapter there is a chapter in the Beyond Byzantine book which um, which is uh, which has which is a good example of how important historical context is, uh, and I think it's the one particular chapter by Nawa Osman uh, titled Islamism in Singapore, uh, even though the subject of the chapter is Islamism. Uh, it shows how uh, the influence of uh, external events can influence our Islamic tradition within the Malay community. And in this case, it resulted, um, it, it resulted in, the Muslim, uh, in the Malay Muslim community to adhere more strictly to the ritual aspects of Islam, and which resulted in um, you know, certain friction within the Malay community and the Singapore society at large. So when we talk about our Islamic tradition, uh, it's important to include two entities as well whose presence has been uh, constant throughout, uh, constant in our Malay community, and also uh, in a sense instrumental because they are the enactors of our Islamic tradition, which is our Islamic laws and institutions. So when I, uh, what I mean they are the enactors of our Islamic tradition would be, I would refer to Amma means, uh, which stands for the Administration of Muslim Law Act. And I think all of us here at the Malay Muslim community are greatly, uh, inf uh, greatly affected by AMLA because it has, uh, it, uh, it has uh, you know, large, it, uh, it, en it encompasses several areas such as 
uh, our inheritance laws, our family laws, marriage laws, and so on. So our book was a very important role in our women's comments in the sense that it helps uh, hold our Islamic tradition. So at the same time, our religious laws uh, reflect our understanding of Islam, and also not just understanding of Islam, but our customs and our Malay customs and traditions as well. So after religious laws, I think another uh, important uh, entity that we need to acknowledge is the importance of our Islamic institutions. So Islamic institutions, I, I would refer to uh, such as Mu'is, uh, RFM, uh, Sharia Court, our mosques and our madrasas. So if you look at the history of our Islamic institutions, it's clear that their roles have morphed in sense over time. So for example, uh, I would use the highlight of how our mosques 20 or 30 years ago, we had no roles such as social development officer, uh, da'wah officer, you know, family development officer, and so on. You know, I think 20, 30 years ago, there was only the ustaz, the imam, and the But I think now we look, our mosques have really changed over time. We have a variety of roles, actually. So, and I think the reason why our Malay community has successfully incorporated these roles is because we understand the, the social dynamics, the history, and the emergence of our uh, of, of, of our mosque in our local context. So therefore, if we are to reevaluate our Islamic traditions, we cannot do so, we cannot exclude the annexes, which is our Islamic laws and institutions. So um, at the same time, while we, uh, in our efforts to change and improve, right, I think it's important that we have a form of appreciation. For example, I think, um, like Mr. Zainal's story just now, we, uh, we, we know how how different our uh, you know, uh, how Singapore back then and now. So I think it's important that we have uh, a perspective of, of appreciation when we when we uh, when we fight for progress and so on. So I think uh, a part of appreciation is encapsulated well in one chapter in the Beyond Bicentennial book, which is written by Usta Taufik, uh, which in highlighting the historical narrative of Amla in the birth of Muiz, he raised a point. Um, uh, which highlighted that Singapore was the only former British colony that has an Islamic religious council institutionalized in our constitution. And while this may seem simple enough, I think um, it makes a whole lot of difference, especially when we consider our local context, our multi-religious and multicultural context. So on to my last point, um, is about religious figures. Right? So I think religious figures uh, are strongly interlinked with my previous two points sense that uh, when we talk about the Da'wah uh, revivalism movement, it, it is the religious figures who, who played an important role in, um, in bringing this movement to, uh, to the Malay community. And also when we talk about our religious laws and institutions, it's of no surprise that our religious figures play an important role in, the, in their establishment and their, in the current running of it. So uh, with the centrality of our Islamic traditions within the Malay community, it means that our religious figures have uh, an important leadership role within the community. And I think this role is one that needs to be constantly re-evaluated. Right? So if we evaluate the history of our Malay community, uh, I think our religious figures have made a lot of contributions, not just in the religious field, but in several aspects as well. And I think, uh, as highlighted in the, in the Beyond My Sentinel book, I think one good example would be uh, Ahmad Ibrahim. Now, I think we, we, we might not define him as a religious figure in the conventional sense, but I think we cannot deny that his contribution in the religious field in the form of Amla has been immense. Right? It has been impactful until today. So, uh, I think the chapter about my friend, uh, you know, about his life, about his work, about his, uh, about his efforts, um, encapsulates well on what a religious figure in today's context should strive for, meaning that we should strive to use our Islamic traditions as a force for development in several aspects of our community, not just in the religious field. And other than that, I think we have to highlight other figures as well, uh, such as Professor Said Hussein uh, Abbas, who wrote the book, Kita Dengan Islam Tunggu, Tira Berkong, which I think is a very good book. So, however, while the contributions of such figures, such as Professor Ahmad Ibrahim and uh, Hussein Abbas, I think that the current discourse uh, understates the contribution of our conventional religious figures. You know, uh, for example, we have uh, uh, Dr. Bhaji, a Mufti, uh, our uh, Mufti Sayyid Nasamid and others. And I think our generation, the youth, including myself, we have much to learn about the legacy and contribution, contribution of this, uh, of our con uh, conventional 
within this field. And the reason why it's important is that their, their work, their contribution, their legacy have the power to influence the current generation. We can learn much from their efforts um, to help underling communities. So, however, as we evaluate the role of our religious figures into this context, I think that um, you know we, we can see that our religious figures are wide, have widely a scope of influence. Uh, more, uh, you know, they are, our religious figures are entering uh, adjacent sectors such as social work and entrepreneurship. But I think uh, I'm not of the opinion that uh, our religious figures still have to um, retain their core principle, and that is on religious discourse, right? And I think the main today, uh, the main issue today is. is the direction and scope of the current religious discourse that we have in Singapore, right? Because uh, I think uh, our Islamic, for if we hope to ensure that our Islamic traditions remain relevant, remain impactful, then we need to ensure that our religious discourse is of good quality, heading to the right direction, right? Because if our discourse is poor, then our then the impact of our Islamic traditions is restricted. So, and I think this is how our youth can come to play. Um, Meaning that we can, uh, by evaluating the, religious, the current religious discourse of our religious figures, the youth perhaps can help nudge you know, the religious discourse into the right direction. For example, not just focusing on freedom and racial issues, but perhaps social and communal issues. So, allow me to end my uh, presentation with an uh, excerpt from Hilary uh, Shahjah uh, from the book. And she says, uh, The British also had already negative perceptions towards Islam. We considered the religion to punish the, plur the plurality of the Malay island culture. This was not true. In fact, Islam had enriched the Malay culture. And I believe this is right. I think our Islamic traditions have helped enrich our Malay culture, but I think it is of our job, our responsibility, to ensure that it continues to do so in our, in our current context and in the future. So that's all from me. Uh, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Rubik. It's nice to hear a young Ustad having this high hope and critical looking at the past traditions and the potential future. And let's hope uh, young gentlemen and gentle lady within the Asatiza group here yeah, also take part actively in promotion of the uh, social discourses on, on Islam at the same time maintaining the core business of the religious discourse, which is the theology, the tafsir, right, and the uh, faith and so on, which is actually their yeah, core business. And I think over the years, we have not seen a much uh, discourse from within Singapore, right? We have publication, right, in mostly of summary time or biography, but we don't have. So one day, let's hope we have produced uh, great theologians, great fukah, right, or uh, great uh, uh, scholars of uh, Sharia also, right? I mean, because uh, Singapore is the very center of Nusantara, and uh, because of the multiracial and the very complex dynamics of development here, there's a possibility that uh, uh, our Satisa can develop in this direction, right? There's a lot of effort needs to be made, but I think the vision and the planning needs to be done, right? On that note, we have our last uh, presenter, uh, Ms. Nohikman. Thank you. I think now we are dealing uh, mostly on community issues and of course the role of women. Might you may want to pick up your time. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Good afternoon everyone and to our distinguished editors, Chief Uwain, Mr. Zayman, and Mr. Mashahid and our moderators of the staff. Thank you to the organizers from World Scientific Singapore and the Malay Heritage Foundation for having me as a panelist to discuss the recently launched publication Beyond Bicentennial Perspectives on Malays. Today, I will be discussing what it means to be Madrika, issues of educational and women's development in a Malay Muslim community. When I read the Beyond Bicentennial publication, one of the things that stood out was the spirit of Merdeka. You see this in the efforts that the Malay Muslim community has endeavoured since independence and how it continues to shape our direction for the future. 
It reminds me of one of the strongest critiques of colonialism that is Kazim Ahmad, a prominent Yemeni writer, poet, and intellectual, who had this to say about what it means to be Madrika and what it means to recognize the realities of colonialism and what it did to society. I quote in Malay, Pada tahun-tahun yang memuluhan, sastrawan berkomited menentang penjajahan, menggalakkan manusia supaya ingin merdeka. Kerana dengan menghapuskan penjajahan, kita mengharapkan manusia akan lebih maju, tidak tertindas, hidup lahirnya dan tidak tertekan kebebasan berfikirnya. Jadi, komitmen setakat di situ sahaja. Selepas itu, komitmen itu meningkat sedikit. Komitmen kepada perubahan-perubahan sosial menentang penindasan ataupun ketidakadilan dalam masyarakat. Lahirlah sastra yang dikatakan kritikan sosial mengkritik pihak yang tidak adil. Komitmen kepada idea hendak menegakkan keadilan, kebebasan dan menghapuskan kezaliman penjajahan. In English, in the 1950s, writers were committed to resist colonialism and encouraging people to desire independence for Madika because by eliminating colonialism, it was hoped that humanity could advance, would no longer be oppressed, that throughout their lives, their thought would never be unencumbered. Our commitment was to that only. Afterwards, these commitments expanded to include social change as well as well as resisting oppression and injustice in society. Thus, were born literary works that can be described as social critiques, criticizing unjust parties committed to the idea of upholding justice, freedom, and elimination of colonial cruelty. From his quote, we see that to be Madrika, it is simply not enough to just liberate from the shackle, physical shackles of colonialism in the national sense. There is a need to address the psychological impact and the social conditions that have been brought upon segments of society because of colonial systems of injustice. If we understand colonialism, we understand how migrants and the Malay population suffered under colonial rule, which has psychological, socio-economic, and political impacts lasting even after colonialism. In Lady Zubaydah Rahim's book titled The Singapore Dilemma, The Political and Educational Marginality of the Malay Community, she speaks of how the educational lack of the Malays had its roots in colonialism and how this was perpetuated due to the fact that Malays were disproportionately represented in low-income groups in Singapore. This had catastrophic effects for Malays in the domains of education and later on employment and became an issue during the early years of the country's development. The Beyond Bicentennial publication also explores the educational developments of the Malay Muslim community, and we see that since the 1980s, many efforts have been undertaken to combat such impacts, such as the establishment of Mandati, to provide access to education, resources, and network for Malay students, particularly for the low-income groups. These efforts are commendable, but if we are truly committed to resolving educational inequality, then we cannot settle for piecemeal solutions without critiquing structural inequalities. This has been warned by Dr. Jalil Maru in 1996, where he cautioned against the pitfalls of educationism. Educationism is a trend of thinking that denies the need or the value of recognizing other socio-economic or socio-historical problems of the community, even as problems which might impede education and assume all problems are educational. And secondly, it prescribes education as the ultimate solution for all problems. The issue with only providing education as a solution, whether in the form of enrichment classes or skills upgrading or engaging with parents from low-income families, is that parents and students from higher-income families are also doing the same and more. Many experts have warned of horizontal inequality. While it is true that Malays have improved substantially, the rest of society is still moving upwards on the social ladder. In her book, This is What Inequality Looks Like, sociologist Yu Yu Yen describes that there are many programs and funding that 
target children from low-income families to improve their educational outcomes. And this overwhelming presence of such programs often leads to the perception that these children are less motivated or lack the right home environment for studying. She says that these perspectives are not well perceived, but they are insufficiently precise. The logic goes that if our systems are fair, then surely the students fail because parents are not doing what they should be doing. To understand why kids from low-income households do poor in school, we must also step back and situate their lives in the broader social context, which includes trying to understand what material conditions are like for parents, what school experiences are like for kids, and finally, and least often then, what higher income families are doing for their kids. It is when we do all of this, we can have a more complete and accurate understanding of how kids from low income families within this system are compelled to play a game they cannot win because someone else is setting the rules. When we look at what parents from high income families are doing for their children, we start to realize that children from low income groups barely stand a chance. They can afford to do more than just tuition. They can buy books and educational resources. They can cut back on full-time employment. They can afford to provide their children with cultural capital, which Juliet explains as how to socialize children in ways of speaking, relating to authority figures, and understanding things like art and music, which are qualities that schools reward but do not teach. These parents learn and understand how these systems work and they actively play the game to improve their children's educational outcomes. When we look at this larger context, we realize that only providing enrichment classes is not enough. And as the Ministry of Education moves towards a more holistic assessment of children and de-emphasizing quantitative examination scores, we have to question whether this means that children from low-income families will have more opportunities to climb up the social ladder, or will it set them even far more apart than their counterparts from higher-income families who can afford to do more than they ever will? In short, we cannot talk about educational inequalities without understanding poverty and critiquing the structures that continue to perpetuate such inequalities in society. If we are really committed to living up to Merdeka as the future, we need to be able to look at structural barriers and dismantle systems that perpetuate injustices in society. Another issue that the publication touches on is the role of women in history and development, which is typically neglected. History is often a narrative of successful and powerful men, even though women are extremely pivotal to development and progress. This glaring lack of her story often means that women's issues are downplayed and blindsided when we discuss what development means to the community. And this problem is exacerbated by the fact that Muslim women's activism today is not a common feature. And even when there are such efforts, they are often marginal, marginalized, and selectively forgotten by conservative and traditional voices in the community. This is a far cry from the multiple voices of Muslim women and men, such as activists Chi Zahara and religious scholar Said Chi Han Hadi, who advocated for education for women, more strict regulation of marriages, divorces, and polygamy to protect women, and skills upgrading and development. Dr. Suzanne Kadir's work, articulated in her article in 2005, still rings true today. The lack of priority placed on addressing gender issues in Singapore is not unique to the, to the Muslim community. Campaigning for gender equality remains a struggle for women's groups here. However, the problem is more acute within the Muslim community. In large part, this is because there is far less organized activism and awareness on gender issues within the Muslim community. And without awareness about gender and without proper representation, women continue to remain silent on matters which directly affect them, or I would say silenced. Today, women's groups exist, but their focus domains are typically confined to matters relating to the family and social welfare, and we hardly have Muslim women groups who examine our institutions and policies 
and look at how they affect Muslim women, even though such efforts are much needed in the community. And even when we do have Muslim women representation, whether it's politics or institutions like the Sharia court and religious organizations, change is still slow, especially the shift in values and perceptions towards women. This points to the need for effective representation, by which I mean critical examination of structural factors in our institutions that impinge on the rights and impede the development of Muslim women in the community. Underlying these concerns about education and women is the issue of development. During the Singapore Malay Muslim Development Congress in 1989, the narrative and vision of development was encapsulated in the words, ke arah pembangunan yang lebih menyeluruh, literally meaning, towards a wholesome and propitious development. We should not be questioning, development for what and for whom? Clearly, at that point in time, the community leaders had socio-economic development in mind. However, we see today that there are persistent issues that disadvantage certain segments of the community. We should not be discouraged by this. Rather, it is a call to re-evaluate our ideas and direction of development. This necessitates a rethinking of our values that orientate our structures of thinking and our ideas of development. As Dennis Gouinier said, However, it redefines development as a normative experience. It involves, for those who propose it, central value choices about the meaning of life. Development is always experienced as good or bad, usually as both, but never as neutral. If we want to take up the task of building the future, we need to have a conversation about what matters in society. And in our efforts to build that future, how can we ensure that justice is upheld for all so that nobody is left behind? One example of questioning and rethinking our values has been the change in the Human Organ Transplant Act in 2008. Previously, since 1987, the Islamic Religious Council came up with a ruling that Muslims were prohibited from donating their organs for fears that they would desecrate the bodies of the dead, among other reasons. Professor Said Hussein Alakan of the NUS Malay Studies Department had criticized this religious opinion as it did not uphold progressive religious values. And he pointed out that this had implications for the development of the community. As the organ donation is on a priority based allocation, Malay Muslims who did not participate in the program were severely disadvantaged as they were not prioritized on the organ donation list. Exchanges back and forth between the professor and the religious authorities are recorded in his book, aptly titled Dear Ben Musa. al criticism is a call to re-evaluate and re-examine our values that we hold as a society. We simply cannot depend on piecemeal, short-term, and one-off solutions or activism for a sustained effort at upholding justice in our community. We have developed infrastructures to support the progress of our community. And now, it is upon us to strengthen our institutions and develop critical discourses so that they can continue to remain relevant. The way to move forward is to have a deeper critical engagement with our past and to take responsibility for rethinking our ideas of development and progress for society. On top of that, we also need to commit to rethinking our values and structures of thinking and do away with customs and beliefs that are unthinking, uncritical, and impede the development of our community. As Dr. Mark Sharri Maruf states, the progress of any community depends also on its humanism, or in other words, on its conception of the human personality and its capacity for self-determinism. There must be respect for the human will to take charge of his life and existential conditions. And from this, we understand that Merdeka is not just a cry for the right of determining the future of our country, but it is a sustained and engaged effort at pursuing justice and freedom for all. Only then will we be truly Merdeka. Thank you. Thank you very much. Man, you want to deliberate uh, presentation. It's like um, a thesis presentation, isn't it? So, right? <laughs> she really, really uh, let us go through uh, a series of uh,
with your property quotation. Yeah? And I'm sure tonight all of you might be going and searching for those books and some articles. Yeah? Alright, uh, now the, 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 the modus operandi will be uh, that our uh, young speakers will ask questions. Uh, but because of interest of time, please ask direct question. All right, no more comments. Just direct question to your senior. All right, if I may use the word senior, yeah. Right. Uh, of course, our senior. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, direct them, and then uh, and our senior speaker will respond very quickly because uh, I think we will spend more time later on with the Q&A with the audience and those from the team. All right, can we start with the other? Very shortly. Yes. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, what do you think uh, is the role of our leaders in generating a critical resourceful consciousness among our youth? The role of our leaders. The role of our leaders in generating the critical discourse. Yeah, right? Discourse. Critical historical discourse, critical social discourse in the community. Uh, what what the, the role of the leaders is? Okay, I think uh, critical uh, thinking does not begin with the leaders, it begins with the school. I remember that uh, in my old days, when we were doing comprehension uh, papers, we just answered the question like that. But now, I understand that teachers, when they give a passage of they formulate the question in such a way that you have to dig, to think deeper into that. So critical thinking starts from the school. Okay, for the leaders, I think, is for them to be open-minded. In other words, they are not the people who knows everything. They must be prepared to be criticized and maybe at times, occasionally, ridiculed. So that encourages the people to know that you know what you say is not what you think is correct from your perspective. So I think leaders should be uh, open-minded enough to accept uh, critical uh, comments and, and questions from the uh, well, from the junior. <laughs> yeah, maybe there's one thing that if I may add, yeah, Papa. Uh, apart from school, apart from leaders being open, I think leaders also need to be to create space. Uh, discourse is not just coming from campus, yeah, from schools. Discourses need spaces, right? and spaces means actually like this 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 forum is a space, right? If leadership has no vision that space is important for discourse, there won't be any discourse, right? Coming together, we pull out resources with this. This is uh, the wheel of the leadership. So, yeah. But yeah. now I'm glad this is a very good example. The way you did the presentation to me is very, very open mind, mind uh, opening of mind. I am glad you didn't do, for example, like previous years you say, oh, let me dig who is really the digger. They pray, you know, and the end will say, how can you this can do with that? I'm glad you have taken that different approach, both of them. You want to present a new breed of Oh, do, do, do. Uh, Ustaz, what's the same? I teach the teacher no question. We just listen. Right? But this open space is very difficult if you want to open up. There's no monopoly of wisdom that you mentioned. Yeah. And I think you want to recognize that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Alright, now, uh, Ubi, uh, what's your question to who? Uh, to Dr. Noor Shahir. Yes, Dr. Shahir. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think about the presentation I mentioned about the Jamal or the religious movement, like, you know, external harm and everything like that. So my question is, uh, what do you think are the values or principles our Malay youth should have when coming to face with such uh, you know, similar problems or events in the future? This sounds like a press conference. <laughs> <laughs> conferences, academic conferences, we try to think. But uh, talking about revivalism is something that's closest to my heart. I've written quite a bit about it. And it takes a few lectures to explain it. But uh, what can you think? I think, uh, you know, we're starting 
revivalism is it's a phenomenon adapted in the 70s and 80s. Uh, the players and the actors are protecting me by seniors here. I mean, they are part of this kind of this movement. But Adira, I think Jim Meadow was mentioning about the script in India. This is a very important example. Uh, and I think it's important also to relate it back to our book. It's the importance and significance of studying history as context. Okay. I always tell my students, you want to study about Islam in Singapore? You study before 1970. You look at Tiramani movies, you look at Hong Kong dress, you look at how they are behaved. And then you compare who posts the revival. So there's an evolution. So, so what are the things that, uh, that you use to do in understanding the impact of revivalism? I think it's to understand history. And people are still here. I think it's good to, to speak to them, to talk to them, ask them about Islam is not monolithic. We should not be thinking that our Islam is always the right Islam. You know, and that one to look at different historical practices. And the other thing is also to look at uh, developments in other parts of the world as well to compare and contrast how societies uh, have evolved. So I think that's very important.
put here, I think it's uh, quite hard to... Okay, Diana, you, you two answer this. I don't want to answer this. Why do you like the question again? I'm not clear. Okay, so the question here that she asked, your name, Sonali? Dini. 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 Dini asked, uh, how do we approach yeah, uh, teaching the young ones to ask questions about bullying? How, how do we decolonize the way they look at things?
somehow the other ones try to do some of things that those with the social sciences and humanities is slightly more critical and those in sciences and technology might not be. Uh, yeah, just a general observation, all right? Uh, I think it's, it's relevant and you asked, uh, asking any, anyone who can answer. Yeah? Uh, and he, I think his context is the politicized historical narrative. Whereas in our case, it's not true, right? In the sense that it's, it seems neutral. And therefore, it's assumed that everybody can accept. But of course, that neutrality comes from a certain ideological underpinning, right? And that the critique of ideology is not that. I don't know what, that's my reading. Mr. Zanu or the rest of your Rigma. Political veteran. Political veteran. It's not the question part, it's basically the observation, yeah. right? Uh, how do you, the young ones can uh, can deal with uh, this uh, historical narrative which is not uh, politicized, and how do they address it? Uh, I, think, I think it's not just Indonesia or other countries. Almost everything is politicized. And we need to break You know, we may think that we are more open Singapore context too, a lot of things have been put inside. And in fact, recently I was shocked with a bit in what had one Chinese writer say, Singapore must make sure that we remain 70% Chinese. Otherwise, we will not be able to practice the meritocracy. And, and we see the threat of meritocracy in Malaysia or in other parts of the world. So we want to retain it. Now, you may not see that as being put inside, but that is different in the context of majority, minority situation. So I think politicization happens everywhere. Whether it's a colonial politicization or whether it's a modern context of politicization is there. So that's more, that's why all the reasons why we need to have this effort. Whether it's in the book which we did, so that people do step up and say this is our belief and we share that belief and we want it for all of Singapore. So we minimize the, the political, the narrow politicization but you can't run away from the fact that a lot of things will continue to be put in place. Yes. Uh, I use the word the ideological underpin because it seems not politicized, right? But uh, at the root of it, the ideological, of course, it's uh, politicized. Yeah? All right, whatever term you want to use, but we know that there is a need to uh, engage all these two Yes. Okay, why don't you add? Yeah, Dr. Sai, I could just uh, add on to the comment. I think, and you agree with observation that um, in Singapore it may not be politicized, but there is a certain way of looking at colonialism, talking about colonialism, such that it is both good and bad. And I think, um, okay, I, I have a few quotes here that I, I feel is very relevant. Um, so in a recent uh, publication uh, launched by Ipam Book Raffles, Renowned Towards a Merdeka History, uh, edited by Asian Sa'ad Farid Durani and Sai Ki Min, uh, Sai Ki Min is a historian, and she said, that what this vocabulary enabled was the performance or semblance of critical thinking about colonialism. To use commemoration, not anchor and reflection. We are not celebrating 1819 and colonialism. Be fair and balanced, especially to rebels. Colonialism was both good and bad. And I think the problem with articulating this perspective is that when you contextualize in the domain of what has been the status quo, is that there has not been many or different perspectives about colonialism, the realities of colonialism. And what has been dominant um, is the way that we look at colonialism is as if it is part of our achievement as like a modern nation state. And I think one of the ways in which we can expand our view on this is to recognize colonial critiques and anti-colonial perspectives. So for example, um, like uh, the book by Said Hussein al uh, on Thomas Sanford Raffles, he more or former. He says, as far as Singapore is concerned, the problem is the exaggeration of his Raffles, so-called good qualities rather than the, their opposites. His role in the history of Singapore has also been exaggerated. As far as Singapore was concerned, had Raffles not been around, another man would have done the job. By an enlightened 19th century standard, his generous ethical and intellectual outlook was parochial and superficial. To rank him as a humanitarian reformer um, is to abuse the use of the term. 
and this was articulated in the book. And I feel that um, the more we listen to anti-colonial perspectives, make room for such critique, then we realize that history is not actually that simple. It's very complex. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Ismail. Another question? Did we get another question here? All right. Why MHF take this mission, right? One of it could be a platform 
where social discourses can be initiated. And we want more young um, Singaporeans to come on board, particularly. Right? Uh, me, Dr. Charil, right? Uh, we are just initiating these kids, right? After that, you know, your generation should stay. Yeah? Part one and uh, kids I know generation, they have done their job already, right? Very right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, still very important, yeah. Uh, not very away. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, me and Dr. Shari also we will get our feet yet, you know. So, <laughs> so you know, we can relate on problem, but you guys should come ahead. I think that's that's what we need, and you students and stuff like that. Yeah? Um, okay, one question from Facebook, any? Any? So far no? Okay, we have uh, at least one more question. One question, one last question. Okay, that would be good. Alright, for that.
to my surprise, none of them mentioned about multiculturalism or multi-religious Singapore. They were more interested in the challenges of the future, talked about sexuality, talked about gender problems, talked about LGBT. Those are the issues that are actually on their mind now, rather than all this multiculturalism or multiracialism, equality, what that means. If they talk about inequality, it's about social inequality, the different classes. No more about that in the way that In fact, last week there was uh, this Vishwan's uh, program about uh, inconvenient questions, eh? inconvenient questions. Again, they will not discuss about ethnic inequality, but social inequality. Because it's easy areas. I think we are conscious, we know where we are coming from, but make sure we don't repeat the whole problems. For the future, the future challenges are changing, the young minds are changing, and if we are conscious for that, I think we are in a good state, a good position to manage the challenges. Thank you, Jim. All right. On that note, we are almost at the end of our forum. All right. Before I close, just uh, I'm requesting each and every one of you, especially the young ones, and then later on I go to the seniors, one minor of what, how you want to close, one line, yeah? How you want to close beyond my centralism and forging ahead to build the a more inclusive, democratic discourse. One line. Yeah. I think um, I, I would like to end on hope, um, but also something that my follow up very essential. Something very simple. If you want to engage in critical thinking, um, as of what you mentioned uh, during this forum, I think the easiest thing that we can do is to question. Keep on questioning. Development for whom? Colonialism is bad for whom? Good for whom? And I think once we keep on questioning and questioning, then that's when we engage in building a more critical discourse. Okay, Sigma, keep questioning. Yeah? <laughs> Meaning that, uh, yeah, in pedagogy, yeah, it's not to look for answer, but to have a relevant question. All right? To start. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as you talk about, you know, uh, colonial problems and everything. I think it's a critical and questioning, but also at the same time, uh, as I highlighted just now, it's good to have a perspective of appreciation as well for our current situation, of, uh, from how far we have come to our current event. Uh, if I may <laughs> uh, quote a Quranic verse, in Shekel to Mu'al Zidane, meaning that if you are uh, grateful, then we will um, uh, we will multiply our, our bounty upon you. Meaning that if you are grateful, then inshallah, um, uh, but not like someone's head and everything, but we need to put in effort. But it's important to have a sense of appreciation as well. Yeah. Appreciation, syukur, yeah. So, I'm kidding, right? I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm going to be able to do it. I'm going to be able to do it. So, let me say, it's a branch here, because I'm saying about everything, but often questioning, appreciation, Authentic. Yeah. There must be authentic to something that is problematic or masalah. So we tell equation for authentic. Okay. <laughs> Alright, now back to our one last one. One line only, one. Ibu Dr. Sani tak paham tadi. One line. Okay. We are here to talk about the book and we are positioning the book against the background of Singapore's history. So my, my one line is that in Singapore's historical annals, there was a matter.
from uh, the our audience for the question and for your time. Oh yeah, <laughs> I was so quite close. <laughs> That's my style, also, you know. Yeah. So my uh, my conclusion is this, right? Uh, for us to forge ahead, we need to have a very clear, substantive diagnosis. Without a substantive diagnosis, we cannot envision, we cannot plan for the construction. That's one thing. On that note, thank you so much. Then we'll like to sit on there. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And hope to see you, everyone, again in the next forum of Saint Martin. Right? Do join us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is uh, where you need to uh, give your feedback. Yeah, I hope you give your feedback. It's a QR code, right? This is very important so that we can plan further.